Join over 5,000 attendees for the largest AI event in Asia, Super AI in Singapore, June 5th and 6th, 2024. Edward Snowden, Benedict Evans, Balaji Srinivasan, and over 150 others will hit the stage, joining the industry's most influential to explore and unveil the next wave of transformative AI technologies. Singapore will become a vibrant AI hub for a full week from June 3rd to the 9th, with over 150 side events that will make for unparalleled networking opportunities. Visit superai.com for 20% off tickets with the code REALVISION. Look for the link in the description. Hey everybody, welcome back to Three Ideas. It's been a minute, but I'm super excited because we have a legendary chartist, Peter Brandt with us. We're both here in Arizona, if you couldn't tell from the U of A shirt that Peter is donning. Great to have you with us. You're enjoying enjoying the sunshine out here, Peter? Hey, I'm enjoying the fact that uh, my Arizona Wildcats were, were moved to the number one ranking uh, in college basketball over the weekend. So go Cats! Not bad at all. The sun is shining on lots of us here. Uh, listen, this is a bit different from usual because three ideas. First, we like to talk about people's global macro outlook before we get into their specifics. I know you're going to talk about U.S. equities, Bitcoin and gold. But it's hard to ask you about your global macro outlook because you're so chart based. That's what you're legendary for. And that's what you're going to do with us today. So if I ask you that question, you're not really going to respond, are you? Uh, yes and no. I, I mean, in, in a way, no. I mean, the reality is I draw lines on charts. I, you know, I keep bar charts and uh, for just every conceivable commodity and financial asset in the world, not individual stocks. But uh, yeah, I make my decisions based on how charts look to me. I, and the interesting thing is I usually don't like to create, you know, I first look at the chart and then I kind of think of what's going to drive this, right? What? And so I kind of, tr I come at it from the wrong way. I don't have a global macro outlook and say, based on that outlook, this market should do this, this market should do that, this market should do something else. I look at the composite of the charts that I see and then try to think, what could make all this happen? And so I, I, I flip it around and I, I know the three ideas that you know we may talk about today, there there is a common denominator. And the common denominator is the fact that when I was born, a dollar was worth one dollar, and a dollar now has the purchasing power of four cents. And for people born today, when they are my age, the dollar may not be worth anything at all. And so the, the really the global macro thing that ties the things together today, the markets that we could whether we might want to talk about are really the fact that uh, fiat currency will lose value to anything that ha it, that has some semblance of being real, uh, whether it be Bitcoin or gold or the US stock market, is all financial assets are purchasable in U.S. dollars. And if so we're looking for the U.S. dollar over a multi-decade period to continue to lose value in terms of purchasing power, my global macro is really short dollar bet. And, and before we launch into your first idea, you and I have been talking uh, behind the scenes, and I thought you said something really interesting. If you're a fiat bear, you should be invested in the U.S. stock market. Just flesh that out for us before we jump into that first idea that you have around U.S. equities. Uh, oh, you, you know, you hear that all the time, don't you, Sam, is people uh, who look at the U.S. debt load. You know, they look at this, you know, th three, uh, you know, third trillion debt and growing, growing by leaps and bounds. And they say because of that, uh, the economy is going to go into recessionary periods. Economy could hit periods of trouble. Uh, because of that, uh, U.S. dollar really is going to lose its value greatly. But when you think about that, in order to buy stocks, you're really shorting the U.S. dollar. 
ownership of stocks is a long stock, short dollar position. And so uh, it's a real asset that one takes greenbacks, which ultimately will become more and more worthless and converts it to something uh, with real value. Uh, a, a corporation that's growing, has good ideas, uh, will have earnings power in the future, may develop new technology and so forth. So yeah, I, I've really never figured out how you can be bearish on the U.S. dollar and also bearish on the U.S. stock market. To me, they're, they're the opposite sides of a trade. Well, that's really good underpinnings for the ideas we're about to talk about, given the, the fact uh, you're pretty agnostic on all of these ideas in theory, just letting the charts tell you where to go. And if anybody has any questions for Peter for any of these ideas as we go throughout the show, uh, I'll be taking your questions live here and putting them to Peter. So with that, let's jump into your first idea, Peter, and that's going long U.S. equities. I know you've got this uh, NQ056 NASDAQ futures and nearby contracts chart, and that's kind of the principal chart that you're looking at for, for this thesis. Uh, it is, and I'm, I'm assuming you sh you're showing that overhead. Is that is that it? That, that's uh, right. Yeah, th thank you, Sam. I don't necessarily see that part, but yeah, I mean, we have a, a classic chart pattern, a well-known chart pattern called the cup and handle, where we rallied up in the Nasdaq in the December of 21, then spent uh, really a number of months through 22 uh, w w with a big correction, which formed a cup, rallied back uh, into the July 2023 high. And we've been since forming this handle. So William O'Neill is is kind of the inventor of the cup and handle. It's a well-known pattern. And uh, what we see in the NASDAQ is a massive cup and handle pattern. You know, the breadth across stocks has has been become really quite remarkable here. We roll ourselves back a couple of weeks. Everybody was talking about, you know, there, there's there's upside movement, seven stocks and nothing else. Well, au contraire, you know, if you're paying attention to the stock market last week, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, the big held the heavy blue tips, chips, ready to rage in the new all-time highs. S&Ps aren't far behind it. And here we have the NASDAQ, with this cup and handle period uh, pattern. And as we uh, complete that, I would think that we could, at that point, see a pretty significant rally in the NASDAQ up to the 22,500 level, possibly toward 25,000. So I, that's a bullish development for me as somebody who, who looks at big patterns and big patterns in stocks this to me is a big pattern in the stock market. And, and usually I would ask people time horizon here, but given the, the chartist nature, I can't really ask that. It really is just a, a price horizon. You're, you're agnostic about the time horizon. No, I'm not. I'm, I mean, not at all. I don't really deal in time. I deal in price. You know, I, I deal in the, in, the, in the price scale. Let's see, they're on the left or the right side of the chart, not the calendar that's underneath it. And, uh, you know, I would say this, and should we see a decisive breakout in this cup and handle, the risk of the trade really is the low of the handle. And should uh, we go back down below the handle, for me, it's back to the drawing board. But uh, as long as we don't, we continue going sideways to up, I would think that when you look at the dominant trend, which has been up, you kind of advance that and we'd be looking sometime uh, late 2025, early 2026 as moving into kind of the target zones for the NASDAQ. And, and another way to look at this, U.S. equities, is the Russell Index. And it's interesting because you say just like in the 90s, we could get uh, small cap stocks. So let's just bring up that chart. That's our second chart of the Russell Index and, and walk us through exactly what you're seeing there and what it means for, for those of us investing. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the Russell chart, again, I look at charts through the prism of, of geometric configurations of construction. What is it, what's the construction on the chart? What are the implications? And the Russell, we've been in just a massive rectangle or a trading zone, a flat trading zone, uh, really going back to early 2022. So 
well, we've got quite a bit of, of, of gun power that's been compressed, compressed, compressed into this trading range in the Russell that's between 1650 and, you know, the 2030 level. But, you know, as long as the Russell's not going up, I prefer to be, you know, long as a futures trader, the indexes of the NASDAQ and, and, and the Dow. I'm, my, my rule as a trader is when I'm long, I want to be long the strongest. When I'm weak, I want to be weak, uh, short the weakest. And the, the Russell really is not the strongest. You know, should the Russell decisively complete this rectangle bottom, I will definitely then take a look at at, at the Russell as a futures contract, trading the Russell in the futures from the long side. Until we can resolve this trading range, for me, I'm just kind of a look and see in terms of U.S. small stacks, uh, small caps. And just to be clear, your your upside target on the Russell index would be? Oh, I, I would think Russell, uh, the, the Russell index could get back to 2250, back to its all time highs. Wow. And and if we break out to the downside, a target? Well, of- yeah, I guess, you know, again, as, as a chartist, I'm willing to accept the fact that, hey, if the market's going up, I want to own it. If it's going down, I want to sell it. I want to short it. Hey, everyone. Have you yet checked out the incredible, groundbreaking new Real Vision platform? See, we've built something that allows you to live your financial life in one place. We bring together the knowledge, tools, and network to help you thrive in your financial journey. We've got AI tools to help expand your knowledge. We've got courses and education. We've got note-taking. We've got pricing and charting. And in addition, we've got obviously the world's best content, both on macro, and crypto to bring everything together. And in addition, you get access to the Real Vision Network. That's our tens of thousands of members across the world where you can connect and chat to them about what really matters to you. Anyway, it's free, realvision.com. We'll see you there. And so those, for those of you who really want to be bearish US stock market, I would say keep your eye on the Russell. The Russell has been the weakest. Weakest tend to stay the weakest. And so should we really break out to the downside of the Russell, which is that 1650 level decisively and roll over and stop showing weakness in NASDAQ, Dow, they start rolling over. You know, for me, I switch gears at that point and would really look at the Russell as my candidate short uh, trade. I just want to jump back uh, one chart, go back to that NASDAQ NQ056 chart, because we have John Kitcher. Uh, good morning to you, John, if you're in this time zone. Good morning. He says, recup and handle on that original chart we had up. What are your thoughts about the double top? Do you put more weight on the double top and potential pullback, or do we break out in the first attempt, Peter Brandt? Well, you know, I would have to go back to uh, Edwards and McGee and Schaubacher and, and, and really make sure that I know a double top is really exactly what it is. Generally speaking, to my two comments to that is we have no double top. We have two tops, but a double top is only completed when we get a decisive close below the midpoint low, which at this point is the cop. And so I have to deal with the pattern that presents itself before me, not the pattern that I dream up in my mind to support the narrative in the back of my mind. You know, I'll, I'll let the market help define my narrative. I won't, don't want to predict the market based on the narrative that, that, that I've already decided must come true. So, yeah, yeah, should we fail up here in the NASDAQ, up in the 16, 16, 5 level, start rolling over? Uh, you know, then, yeah, all of a sudden we start talking about a double top, but there is no double top at this point. We have two highs. We do not have a double top pattern. And even if we do have a double top pattern and close below the, the midpoint low, which is the cup, we could still have 50% rallies from there, according to the rules. The other thing is this is a little bit too stretched out to be a double top. If you really want to look at textbook double tops, they're really patterns that do not take multiple years to develop. There are patterns that tend to take place over months or quarters. A pretty clear answer to your question there, John. And worth noting, 
you know, this is an investment advice. This is, uh, you know, Peter looking at charts through his experience. And, and speaking of that narrative question that you, 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 you targeted there, Peter, uh, someone named Slimy Tom says, hey, everyone, after a great weekend, crypto is holding up nicely today amidst U.S. stock sell-off and rising VIX. Time for the pause that refreshes or a shallow correction in the markets? Now, that might also be a narrative question, which I think you'll answer with the chart. So let's jump in uh, to your, your view through the charts uh, of going long on Bitcoin. And I think we have this graph with the gray boxes and the red lines to, to our yeah. director. We can start off there, Peter. Yeah, I mean, I, I could spend the next, you know, two hours even talking about that chart because, you know, as the person who put it together, uh, all of those things have meaning to me, which may seem lost on the people that we're talking to today, but perhaps they'll pick up on the theme. Let me just point out uh, on Bitcoin is what you see is a chart that goes back, you know, 12, 13 years in Bitcoin it shows really the, the history of Bitcoin since it was priced under a buck. Uh, but Bitcoin is a market unlike any other market that I have traded. It has a chart unlike any other chart I have ever seen in a couple of different ways. You know, Bitcoin, when you look at this chart, this is a log chart. This is not a linear chart. I have a hard time finding parabolic advances in most assets, almost all assets, even one or two in the entire lifetime of that asset on the linear chart. And on a log chart in Bitcoin, we have one, two, three, four completed parabolic advances. And in case, I, people, I, in case people are new to this space, parabolic advance means a you know, huge distance in a short amount of time. Yep, yep, it's an advance that accelerates. It's shown there by kind of those upward sloping accelerated red lines where you, you have a parabolic advance that eventually gets broken. And, and in Bitcoin, we have had the tendency to have multiple X advances, 2X, 10X, 20X, 40X advances that take the shape of a parabolic curve. Those parabolic curves get violated and Bitcoin then experiences corrections of 80 to 85%. Now, Throughout the life of Bitcoin, that's range. I mean, it's ranged from a 78% correction, which has been the most recent correction in Bitcoin from the 2021 highs, uh, back to a 94% correction when Bitcoin is really still a young, almost virgin asset. And so we have these 80% corrections that last many months prior to a new all-time high. Uh, this, Sam, is really my model for Bitcoin pricing that, that I developed a number of years ago. And uh, it has helped me really keep my pulse on the bigger picture of Bitcoin because we have then these corrective phases, which are grayed out in those boxes, uh, which, again, last an average of three years before we see a new all-time high. So... 80%, you know, we get a multiple X parabolic advance, parabola is broken, you have a three-year correction before you make a new all-time high, and that is then in the process of another multiple X advance prior to the same thing. You know, wash, rinse, do it all over again. And that's where we are right now. And I, I think that we are now in Bitcoin in a new parabolic advance. And that parabolic advance began at the November 2022 low, second contact point for what I believe will be the dominant parabolic advance was October 23. And what we will see uh, based on the modeling that I've done is a new all-time high in Bitcoin sometime in the late the third quarter, early the fourth quarter of 2024. Followed then uh, by new all-time highs that could carry prices, I think, somewhere up in the $150,000 zone, which then would take about the period of time that most big bull market parabolic advances take 
uh, in Bitcoin, and that's generally 24 to 26 months from the low point of a bear of a bear phase to a new all time high, which then is broken as a parabola. So that's my look at Bitcoin from a longer term perspective. So just just to summarize, parabolic advances often result in these 80 percent corrections. And then you see a time cycle of about three years, which would put us around looking at these charts, uh, third quarter 2024. And you're thinking of some type of first objective of about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I heard you say. Yep. Yep. And, and, th- and that I would be looking for somewhere in the second quarter of 2025. That lays out a clear timeline. I want to jump to the next chart. This is the Renko chart. Uh, this has the tables on it for our, direct- for our director. Renko charts are a type of chart where they filter out small price movements so that traders can focus on the larger trends. So walk us through what you see here and how that fits with the previous chart that we saw in Bitcoin. Yeah, I I mean, Sam, even from the very beginning when I got involved in Bitcoin, which incidentally was because of a chart that I received uh, by email from your founder, Raul Paul, who uh, back in January, February 2016, sent me a chart of this thing, which is called Bitcoin, which I had never traded. I had heard about it, of course. You know, I, I just thought, hey, this is some... This is some coin that 20-year-olds are buying pizza with, maybe a pair of tennis shoes. But I I didn't know much about it, uh, but I looked at this chart that Raul sent me. I went, this is just unbelievable. I've just never seen a chart. I hate to call charts sexy. I mean, it almost kind of tells you, uh, you know, what us old dinosaurs really think about things. But it was a chart that just blew me away. And of course, I became immediately interested in Bitcoin. Raul introduced me to uh, who he was buying his Bitcoin from. I continue to do my trading uh, with that recommended source by Raul. Bought my first Bitcoin then in March of 2016. And I, I guess I bought it and then I became interested in it. And so I started learning about it. But I, even from the beginning, I felt Bitcoin had a chance to go, 50% chance to go back at the time, 20,000, which it did, 50,000, which it did, 100,000, 150,000. I have a million, okay? I mean, name the price. But it had a 50% chance to go to zero because something along the line, and it could just be absolute frontal attack by every form of government in, in, in the world to shut it down, or it could be new technology, just to think that Bitcoin will never be exceeded in, in, in its nature as a store of value. Because I look at Bitcoin as a store of value, not something to trade, but something to own, to store value of US dollars, convert to US dollars to be stored. Uh, but that things could take place. It might not be the ultimate in mankind's achievement. And even now, this week, we have major announcements by IBM of quantum uh, quantum computing, that quantum quantum computing could eventually hack the Bitcoin code. So a lot of things could happen. But nevertheless, I just have always looked at Bitcoin as an asymmetrical trade. If it could go to zero, I lose 40,000. If it can go to a million, I make 960,000. So... Uh, 60. So you, you got to look at that. So I developed what I felt was a charting model that would keep me long relative that could be very sensitive and not get whipped around. And so I developed this weekly uh, uh, Renko. And what you see there is that it's had a very, very good track record at keeping me long during the advances but sidestepping during the the declines because I still give a 50% probability that at some point Bitcoin uh, really loses its attractiveness as, uh, as an asset. So I, I wanted some sort of way that told me it's time to be all in or it's time to really be defensive. And uh, this model has done very well. As a matter of fact, during, during the life of this model, it's captured $70,000 in net 
travel distance by Bitcoin, even though Bitcoin even today is what, 40, 41,000. So it's almost doubled uh, the, uh, a, a buy and hold position in Bitcoin. Just a tool that I happen to use personally, Sam. That gives us a great perspective. And with that, I want to jump in to your third idea, and that's around gold. I had a lot of people on this show talk about gold, Larry. Lepard, someone you know well, one of our best performers on this show, but he's looking at it from a totally dis- different perspective. He knows the history of these mines, the players who are looking at these mines. You're looking at it uh, through these uh, charts, but maybe before we jump in, before we jump into that chart, you think that uh, the paper gold argument is bogus. I've been talking to some folks in the lead up to the show, so I just want you to kind of lay that out and and yeah, there. well, yeah, I mean that's what we've heard in gold, right? You know, especially silver, is there's a difference between paper and physical that you want to own physical, uh, you don't want to own uh, leverage positions. Well, you know, futures position, the futures position is just paper. Uh, I. I, 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 that's a long argument, Sam, not one that I necessarily think we should get into here. But nevertheless, as a trader, I like paper gold because it gives me leverage. I am not arguing against physical gold at all, in no way. I'm just saying as a trader, I think the futures market are are, are better markets for me. And quite frankly, uh, if you look back at the history of cash, of physical gold versus paper gold, the charts are the same. They look the same. With some some changes relative to the cost to carry, it's for all practical purposes the same chart. And so uh, the chart you're looking at in gold, I believe, is the one that goes back to the beginning of, future, of futures trading in the That's U.S., right. which is yep. early 1970s, tracks gold from there. And what I, I see in gold really going back uh, to the September of 2011, uh, similar r- really to what we looked at in the NASDAQ, big cup and a handle. And as a cup and handle, standard cup and handle pattern, a little bit unconventional in that the handle is sitting up above the high of uh, prior to the cup, which technically places the cup and handle interpretation into a little bit of doubt, but I don't think serious doubt. But again, we have a cup and handle. We talked about that, this pattern last week on the phone prepping for this, Sam, and we haven't broken out yet. And uh, of course, since we've talked, we have seen new all-time highs in gold and have officially completed this cup and handle pattern. Now, Part of that completion was this huge advance in gold over the weekend. So we came in here this morning in gold and saw gold open sharply higher. All it's done during the day now so far is sell off. And so uh, you know, we may have some people say this new all-time high we saw last week and early in the day is, is a big false breakout. And, you know, it, it's a bull trap of all time, bull traps. Well, I, I don't happen to think so. I think the market got ahead of itself, and we may have to digest the kind of gains that we've seen in gold uh, from the Oto- early October lows. We've gone pretty much straight up through those lows, so you know we may have some uh, some j- digesting to do. Uh, but nevertheless, even if when you know when we took and you have a chart which blows up the handle itself. Might want to throw that on where it's just go. a handle. Where if you look at just the handle, what you really have there could be interpreted as as continuation rectangle, or even you can take the March twenty one lows as a, as a left shoulder low. Uh, you, you you take the October twenty two high as the low of a head, and you take the recent low we made in October twenty three as a stunted right shoulder. So you could you you could even call it an inverted continuation head and shoulders pattern with an abbreviated right shoulder, and we have broken out. And oftentimes when you have abbreviated right shoulders, you have very powerful patterns. And that's the type of thing. So I, I'm bullish gold. I think gold goes 2,800, 3,000. We're on our way to 36,000 uh, in gold. I think by the middle of 2025, that 
we are in bull markets that uh, with gold and Bitcoin uh, really will represent, I believe, a sustained multi-month uh, uh, store of value play uh, against the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. And so um, they, these are three trades that I'm involved in. I'm long gold, I'm long Bitcoin, I'm locking, long U.S. stocks as a proprietary trader. And uh, I, I think we're dealing with with very, very strong chart chart story here. And, and of course, the purchasing power and the timelines that you have may be very different from folks in our audience. So it's not just some caveat or legal cover when we say this isn't financial advice because everybody's you know pockets are different and the the horizons you have or the ability to maintain those horizons might be different. I just I just want to follow up. Uh, I, some of your notes have talked about, uh, gold eventually going toward four thousand dollars in mid to late twenty 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 six, I believe, was one of your notes. You you still hold there? Yeah, I, I mean, I do. Uh, again, market's gotten ahead of itself. It's going to it's going to digest gains. I mean, for goodness sakes, you know, we saw. We saw gold back in 2016 at you know 1150, and you know if we're talking about a four thousand dollar move in gold, that's a very substantial move that 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 might take place over a ten year period. That's a big move for gold, and and so I, I think we kind of plateau. It's going to be stair stepping. Gold is not Bitcoin doesn't have the gold doesn't have these multiple x 2x 5x 10x gains it's not the nature of gold it's old it stayed it is an asset used by central banks central banks have been huge buyers of gold in the last year and you know gold is just so established in in what we are as a world in terms of raw materials that it's not going to act exactly like bitcoin so It'd be slow and steady, and there'll be you know periods of two to three months where where gold just kind of has big moves, two, three, four hundred dollar moves, followed by months of congestion and backing and filling. So uh, it's it's not the type of market you want to FOMO buy. Uh, so I don't recommend FOMO buying. I don't recommend people become new buyers of gold here at twenty one hundred. Uh, you, you know, pick your spots and wait for gold to uh, uh, to allow moving averages, for instance, to catch back up on it and uh, buy gold in periods of weakness. And I think over the next few years, it'll be a good investment. And we've got John Kitcher asking another question. Peter, can you drill down into the miners? The catch up trade should be wild. I don't know if you'll go there on your charts. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, what 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 it's talking about, of course, Sam, is is if you chart the price of miners. So GDX is your major miner, DDXJ, junior miners. You have the same thing in silver. You have major miners, uh, minor minor <laughs> minor miners. Uh, it's a tongue twister, but uh, they haven't kept up. And, uh, you know, the argument, of course, is that during high prices, these miners will have extraordinary periods of profitability and that there should be a catch up by miners. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd rather trade bullion. I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not a stock guy. Now, is there a role for me with uh with physically backed gold and silver ETFs, yes, there is. That for me is where the role of physical silver and gold come back in, is the ETFs that represent physical and not paper. Uh, and GLD is an ETF of gold that just represents futures contracts in the portfolio. And and so you know I'm more interested in a gold ETF backed by physical, and I think there's a role for that, most definitely. But miners have problems when we're talking about miners. There's energy costs come into play, uh, government regulations come into play, the Domestic pressure politics. by countries to 
uh, to nationalize the, the mining industry, especially in South America, especially in Africa, as you have governments, Venezuela, et cetera, attempting to nationalize mines. So you've got other issues that face gold miners. And so for me, yes, most certainly uh, all things being equal, I would guess that the miners will have some degree of catch up to the physical gold. But again, it's it, for me, it's a confused play because you get politics, you get environmental issues, you get energy price and other things involved. And Tom wants to take one more try on the physical gold. He says, isn't holding physical gold better for the big risks, miners better for gains in gold bull and paper for trading? Uh, I would say that's not a bad summary. I, I mean, which is what I'm arguing. Yes, for me, it's ETF physicals. That's my hold. Some physical gold. I own gold. I, I've owned gold. Uh, I, I don't even, I, I own gold Krugerrands, which were made in, in South Africa. That That's my ownership of physical gold. If I could buy bars, let's say one ounce bars, five ounce bars of physical gold without paying some exorbitant bar premium, I would recommend that. But unfortunately, when you go and find physical gold in the form of bars, then if they, if they add a numismatic value, which I don't think is worthwhile, and I'm not into the coins. I'm not into uh, the gold coins because, again, I don't want to pay these big numismatic values. To, to me, I'm a commodity trader. I'm not a numismatic coin guy. So, but I think it's a good way to to summarize it. Use paper gold for as a, a leverage trading vehicle, but then focus yourself to the degree possible on physical. And and that, those are all the questions around gold. I want to take a step back now. Uh, going back to Bitcoin, we had Lena Yang asking, "How about Ethereum as well? You have a, a view on on ETH via your charts." I I do. I, I don't know if I gave you a chart on ETH. I do. Uh, I, I don't think so, but we can always put it. We'll bring it back in the comments section yeah. for anybody who wants to go and look at it or put uh, it in the chart section. For for me, I, I'm not a big I'm not a big Ether fan. I know that Ether has uh, Ether has a, a wide following. There's a, there's Ether. I call them crypto maniacs. You got Ether maniacs. Uh, and, and those people who believe in ether really believe in ether. I'm not one uh, because I've dealt with ether as as, as a as functionality and the gas fees you pay and the de- hoops you have to go through to to do things with ether. To me, ether is not a store of value, and I don't think it's very practical from a functionality point of view. And in terms of a chart, Ether is forming a rising wedge dating back to the June 22 lows. A rising wedge, in my view, is potentially a bearish pattern. And so I'm not going to say, well, Bitcoin goes up and Ether goes down. I have never make that case. I'm not sure. But uh, Bitcoin corrects and goes through congestion periods, but Ether goes down. That would be a possibility. So as a chartist, I'm watching this big rising wedge in Ether going back to the summer of 2022 and as a potential bearish pattern, as a potential short that I would probably short against Bitcoin, spot get Bitcoin that I hold. One last question out of left field before we get to something uh, really fun and McDonald's related. Uh, John, who's asked some really poignant questions here. Hi, Peter. Would love your thoughts on the long-term breakout of 10-year rates. On a technical basis, a breakout of a 40-year trend should lead to significantly high, significantly higher highs in rates. So putting you on the spot a bit here, Mr. Brandt. Yeah, I mean, I, I know exactly what he's talking about, that we broke through some super long-term charts that you know, rates have been in a cycle. Rates topped out in the early 80s. And basically went down all of the bottom here in recent years to negative interest rates in in Western Europe and zero interest rates in the U.S. 
and unheard of, uh, unheard of. And then we broke some of the technical chart lines and trend lines and so forth in when we have seen rates increase in the last couple of years, uh, last two years. Uh, that to me does not imply that we have nothing but higher rates ahead of us. Uh, you know, when we break trend lines, it doesn't necessarily change a market from bearish to bullish. It can change a market from bearish to neutral, or in the case of yields, uh, a market from uh, from low rates to super high rates. It just means we're done with the low rates. You, you know, I took a mortgage out on a home in 1983 at 14%. I didn't really think anything of it at the same time. I, when I grew up, all my grew up growing up years, banks were paying four to five percent for savings rates. Uh, you, you know, history shows that four to five percent for ten-year uh, rates are are normal rates. They're normal historically. Now, historically, we haven't had thirty, thirty-five trillion dollars in debt either, and so, but nevertheless. Uh, I'm not, I'm not looking for something where we just are continuing to have worse and worse inflation. I don't think we're going to have three percent inflation, but I think we could we could uh, kind of baseline out at, at four or five percent inflation, and that means that we should have, in the case of Treasuries. We're going to turn the treasuries into a two-way trading affair, big, broad trading affair in 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 notes. Let's say ten-year notes. We will trade in the range of three to six percent for the next several years, and so I don't see any huge trends outside that band. Just want to squeeze in a couple more questions. I lied to you because we have some new good ones coming in here. Uh, DS asking. In markets that are so volatile, gold, Bitcoin, where to put a stop loss? Um, well, if you're a holder, if you're an investor, you don't use a stop loss. You're you're committed. You know, you invest because you believe in it, and you want you want to have, let's say, Bitcoin be be the home where where you have your wealth, uh, and hopefully you're just not in now at. 39, 40,000 that you are long Bitcoin for a long time. So, but as a trader, I will use a stop loss and I, I'm not going to give any precise levels, but uh, I, I will say that I have been a buyer of Bitcoin. When I buy Bitcoin as a trader, I generally risk a max of 1% of my total trading capital. And so uh, th th that is the way I buy and sell, whether it be Ethereum or Bitcoin uh, or gold, I'll put on a trade. And uh, in the case of gold, generally, when I, well, in the case of Bitcoin, if I buy Bitcoin, I'm usually using a, a two to three thousand dollar per Bitcoin stop loss as a trading. Those are my trading positions. That's not my buy and hold positions. That's not the positions I've established based on a Renko chart. Uh, but it's a it's more of a short term chart that I will trade based on daily charts. Is uh, is you know there's been really three buy periods for me in Bitcoin since we've seen the October t November 2022 lows. And in those cases where I bought Bitcoin, in each case I've risked anywhere from you know, one, two, three thousand dollars of Bitcoin. Um, it, it, that's kind of the risk point. But again, that represents, uh, let's say, if I have a million dollar account and I buy Bitcoin futures or I buy spot Bitcoin as as a swing trade, you know, I'll risk ten thousand dollars on the trade. And last one from Lena again, Lena Yang asking, does Peter prefer NDX over SPX in U.S. equities? Uh, well, in U.S. equities, I'm a futures trader. So, uh, you know, I trade NQ. If I was a stock trader, I would trade QQQ. All right. That answers that. Okay. I want to totally change gears here because 
interesting fact about you. You studied journalism. People may not know that, but I think your inquisit inquisitiveness uh, shows in your approach with all of this. And out of journalism school, you end up at an ad agency. Before we play an ad that you wrote and helped create with McDonald's, which is a pretty big commercial folks remember uh, from back in the day who saw it on TV then. Give us uh, a little background on this ad before uh, we play it. We'll put it up on the screen while you chat and then we'll play it out to finish off this show. Nice little uh, holiday cheer to give us in December, but also a reminder that you can switch gears and write a new chapter at any point in a book. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not a type of thing where an individual can claim sole ownership of ads. I mean, ads are, are team written and client improved and so forth. But I, yeah, I, I went to, I worked for a major agency and I worked on the McDonald's account. I was very involved in the McDonald's account. And that was an era where kind of Ronald McDonald's was and was uh, came out of that year. Early 1970s, Chicago, Needham, Harper and Steers and I was involved in some really, really fun commercials, uh, contributing to the, the McDonald's ad program. And one of those commercials was called Grab Your Bucket and Mop. And uh, it just, we had some really fun times with commercials back then. And that was one of the big commercials that, that then came out of that. Of course, I ended up in commodity trading just a couple of years later, but I love my time expressing creativity in in advertising uh, commercials and the McDonald's account was an account I was I was very involved in and with the bucket and mop commercial which you can go ahead and play. All right. Well Peter Brandt, thank you very much for your time, your three ideas. It's always great to have a legendary chartist like you on. Enjoy the sunshine in December here in the Sonoran Desert. And it's uh, John Amos and Anton Williams, if folks remember those folks uh, in the ad here. And we hope to see you here again on Three Ideas and, and Real Vision quite soon. Thanks so much, Peter. Grab a bucket and mop. Scrub the bottom and top. There is nothing so clean. That's my burger machine With a broom and a brush Clean it up for the rush Before you open the door Or to shine on the floor When we finish one then Start all over again Tell me what does it mean At McDonald's it's clean Join over 5,000 attendees for the largest AI event in Asia, Super AI in Singapore, June 5th and 6th, 2024. Edward Snowden, Benedict Evans, Balaji Srinivasan, and over 150 others will hit the stage, joining the industry's most influential to explore and unveil the next wave of transformative AI technologies. Singapore will become a vibrant AI hub for a full week from June 3rd to the 9th, with over 150 side events that will make for unparalleled networking opportunities. Visit superai.com for 20% off tickets with the code REALVISION. Look for the link in the description. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.